up there. Yeah, we're we're right in Portland, so we're sort of southern southern. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure, and, sure. And you probably you probably go up a little bit further up the coast, maybe. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. But it's a, yeah, no, it's a good day here. So we've had some lousy weather. So, but uh, yeah, this is so. Welcome to the main College of Art uh, class. Uh, uh, Kill your semiotics: a critical history of post punk. So. <laughs> Um, and we're, we're really happy to be here because this is our last class for the semester. So it's a great oh, way to a, okay, great. It's a great way to end the semester. And um, you know, uh, we've been talking about stuff all semester. And so your work has sort of come up, you know, multiple times from the very first class when we listened to some very early recordings from Glenn Branca, um, and then we've looked at different artists. And um, so, and we've had a couple of different guests come in, like uh, Pat Place from and Chris oh, Broca. Cool. And we had a and Byron Coley came in, so it's been great to have different artists join us and sort of provide some insights into the in, into the subject we're talking about. So it's 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 really good, and and I, I think you said that you were at, you were at a class last night at Columbia. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, uh, I did a class last night that's being taught by a friend of mine, uh, the performer and uh, musician Annie Gosfeld. And she's teaching uh, George Lewis's class uh, this year, and this uh, it was the first class for there for their summer session. So, oh, their summer session. Yeah, a three-hour class. So it was a it was a long, uh, deep, deep dive into a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, this is a three-hour class, but we won't we won't hold you to three hours. So don't don't worry. What's what what's that class about? Um, New York avant-garde and avant-garde perspectives. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I forget the exact title, but yeah, something that's a, that's like that. Yeah, I mean, we spent we spent just a few weeks alone on no wave, so it's easy to sort of go down into it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Were you using the, these uh, these books? <laughs> yeah, that, and, and we were absolutely were, and that's that's why I had Byron come in because you know. Yeah, he, that's he, great that you had him come on. Yeah, he he was he has you know lots to say, and he's 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 been involved so much. You know, I I think he even released one of your uh, your one of your early solo albums, right? He did. He did. Scriptures of the Golden Eternity. So yeah, he's been, you know, someone like him is so vital because he's been archiving all this music and, you know, writing about it and, you know, and, uh, you know, so it was great to have him come on and sort of tell his story and where he came from and his, you know, you know, how his life sort of has unfolded, um, you know, because he's sort of behind the scenes a bit, but he's a critical yeah. person. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he's been, uh, we've been involved with him for decades at this point. And, and, and I mean, it's hard to believe it. he was even like the first person who sort of wrote about my music for, you know, when I was in high school back for like, you know, national magazines. So really, wow, that's cool. And, and he just wrote the liner notes for a reissue of mine coming out in the fall. So he's, I don't know, he has such a hunger and generosity. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, um, so, so this is, so welcome. Uh, so this is a main college of art, you know, is art school in Mecca and the, these students are all, uh, uh, juniors and seniors. So you have some people graduating next week. Wow, uh, congratulations to you, whoever's graduating. <laughs> Crazy year to graduate. My son just graduated from university as well. And uh, crazy, crazy year to have as your last year of school. Yeah, oh, right. And you you probably didn't even get to go to the graduation, did you? There was no graduation, no cap and gowns, no no nothing up there. He's in Toronto, at Toronto, University of Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's hard. Uh, yeah, it's, it's no, it's been a complex year for everybody, especially I think students are getting a raw deal. But uh, yeah, well, you know, it's a different year for everybody. That's 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 the bottom line. So yeah, well, well, we're really glad you can be here. I appreciate it so much. Um, and uh, well, I thought we could uh, have just a conversation and then leave some time at the end. You know, at some point in the conversation, you might want to share your screen if you have some if we reach some stuff where you think it's good to you know look at that. And, sure. then the, and then the students have some questions too. Um, so we'll sort of get near that at the end. Uh, and, but I, I thought, um, so I'm just making sure I have things set here on my end correct, correctly. Um, and I already test, I believe you can be host and share your screen without, without much trouble. Yeah, okay, I, I think I know how to do it. Um, so I thought it would just be, you know, I, I thought if we sort of started like, sort of now we can sort of work our way back in time a little bit. Um, but, you know, I was just wondering, actually, just sort of as a, an aside, is, uh, um, 
I was uh, just yesterday listening to um, earlier in the week, listening to a at the forks off of a, um, you know your record that came out last year. Yeah, names of North End women. Yeah, I mean it's a, such an amazing record, and I, 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 you know, I'm sort of interested. You know that that one song in particular, I found so sort of disarming and like sweet and almost innocent. You know, and really beautiful. And you know, I'm sort of curious. Like, do you have some sort of interest in sort of Broadway? I mean, because it almost goes beyond the Beatles back to like real sort of, you know, uh, you know, it's very sort of you know direct, very sort of uh, unpretentious, sort of emotional melodic quality to it yeah you know well i mean i i do love a, a good melody and, and that kind of a song that one uh, you know that that record was quite an experimental record in a lot of different ways so even even doing a a piece like that was you know that's a bit more of a like a trad ballad you know in the context of the way we presented it was a bit of an experiment especially in the context of the rest of that record and um that piece came together really naturally. You know how sometimes a song just develops, it just kind of comes into being. I had this sheet of words. There's, there's a bit of a, uh, my partner, Leah Singers from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. There's a bunch of stuff about, there's a bunch of stuff influenced by Winnipeg on, on that record. And uh, that piece, the lyrics were written um, in Winnipeg like a couple of years earlier. And we were playing around with this melodic material and I just picked up that sheet and it just it like just slid right into place like every every line kind of fit perfectly as soon as I tried it and. Um, you know, sometimes when uh, when something like that happens, you just have to trust and go with it because it's it's a, a natural easy fit and uh, so that was that was a case like that that was maybe the most sort of uh, traditional, I never thought about it in terms of Broadway, but that was the most, uh, the most traditional kind of simple song on that record, I think. Yeah, that melody, it's like, na, 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 na. I almost could see somebody like in Hades Town or something sort of singing this on stage. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> I don't know, it just struck me. I'm not a big Broadway person, but it was like, it was like somehow this is going beyond the Beatles in terms of like musicality and, and melody. It was like, it almost seemed like you could see a boy sort of singing this on stage or something. But mm -hmm. So I didn't know if maybe you, you had the secret passion for Broadway or something. I, well, I mean, I, I love a lot of that music and I, have, I always have. So, you know, it's, I'm sure it's in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, uh, so also, you know, I know you, you were really, it was great that you had this show that just closed in Texas at, a, I guess, yeah. West Texas A&M. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because, you know, you know, was that already in the works, you know, prior to this past year? Or, you know, how did that, how did that come you about? Know, um, it was in the works. West Texas A and M is in the town of Canyon in in uh, in the in in West Texas, and it's next door to Amarillo, where Robert Smithson's Amarillo Ramp is. And um, in the mid '90s, I did a record that you probably know called Amarillo Ramp for Robert Smithson, like a long half an hour uh, music piece uh, dedicated to this sculpture site that I'd never been to at the time. And shortly after putting that record out, a young uh, art student from Texas wrote me, and uh, his name is John Rivette, and he, um, he wrote me and said like, hey, you know, I work on Stanley Marsh's ranch, I, I go out to Amarillo Ramp all the time, and I've got a relationship, Stanley Marsh is this uh, wealthy arts patron who paid for the piece and, you know, uh, invited Smithson out there to do it. Um, for those of you who don't know the work or know the artist, Smithson died creating that piece in, 19, in the early 70s. It was so it was his last piece and it was finished uh, posthumously by his wife, Nancy Holt. And, uh, you know, we started talking 20 years ago, maybe, and just been talking ever since. And he's now the, the uh, he was an instructor at a at Texas A&M, and now he's the head of the department. And so, um, in 2019, finally, uh, I went out there and uh, I paid a visit to him and spent some time out at Amarillo Ramp. And we had plans for me to go back and film a version of my piece of music at the ramp and, you know, film it and have drones and stuff out there in the, in the Texas landscape where it is. And that was slated for March of 2020, which, of course, got shut down <clears throat> in the last uh you know, a couple of weeks before we were supposed to do it. And, and we transferred the project to March 2021, which 
it's still not quite possible to happen, but we're hoping that it'll happen sometime soon. But in the meantime, we were talking about some ideas for shows and um, maybe as maybe at one point we thought that I would actually be out there for for filming at Amarillo Ramp in March and we planned the show around that and then the the the, uh, the, the actual being there physically was not possible, but uh, we did put this show together and it turned out to be myself and, and my wife Leah Singer and it is a um, it's a video and sound show. It's it's multiple projections. It's uh, four monitors and eight projections in this fairly large gallery space. Each projection has its own stereo um, uh, audio file, and they're all overlapping and going at once. And we we de we decided to um, we chose as our our source material things we'd collected during this last pandemic year. So in a way, the show frames. March 2020 to March 2021 as kind of a, a basis for, you know, films we made in that period of time, stuff we put on Instagram, you know, whatever, things things we collected visually and sonically uh, over this last year. And so it's kind of a kaleidoscopic funhouse, you know, lots of, lots of uh, everything is looping. So and everything is looping out of sequence. So if you go into the gallery, there's there's 12 different stereo tracks of audio and 12 different images and they're all uh, looping on their own independently so there's never really a moment where the same thing is happening twice and um, because of the nature of this time that you know uh, students there were able to go to the gallery but uh, and and the public too I suppose but it you know it was it was a little bit less uh, well traveled than during a normal you know uh, normal time when when people would attend the gallery so we used it as kind of a laboratory situation and uh, john the john rivet uh, got a lot of his students involved in helping us document it especially since we weren't there so you know we we, we installed it remotely we focused and and you know uh, arranged the projectors and the screens on the wall remotely with a you know zooming in for a few hours kind of setting up the space and um, the first bunch of files I sent, because I couldn't really, uh, we couldn't really mount them here in any way that we could actually tell what it was going to be like. It was pretty much an experiment. We sent all this stuff down there. They, 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 they you know, they put it up. We arranged it and opened the show. And then it was, you know, a lot of the films had uh, like black space in between each film. So screens would go dead and another screen would come on. Sometimes they'd be all on. Sometimes only one or two would be on. And we didn't know if it was going to be uh, too empty or too full, you know, barragey or 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 the or the opposite of that. So it was really kind of an experiment. And, but it actually turned out that the first version worked out really well and was really balanced. And at that point, we thought we would challenge ourselves. So we did a second a couple of weeks in. We did a, we sent a second version of the files that expanded it and included more uh, filmic and material and stills and sort of slideshows and stuff. And uh, and then for the final week of the show, we did a third version where we really narrowed it down to just a handful of, of videos and a handful of audio that we placed on multiple screens. So you would see the same uh, image on two or three screens out of sync with each other, you know, so there were a, a lot of overlapping and repeated sounds and and images in, in a different kind of a sort of kaleidoscopic way. And uh, they all proved pretty interesting. It was a really good uh, laboratory situation for us. Yeah. So that so you were basically editing in New York and then sending down these different films or loops and sounds. Yes. Yes. And each you know each film had its own stereo track with it. Um, yeah. 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 I have a like a five minute sampler of that uh, of that show if we want to look at that at some point. Yeah. I mean, actually, now it could be good now just to get it while we're speaking of it. Sure. Uh, this this was put together by a um, there's I guess there's a regional arts uh, magazine magazine like online magazine down there called Glass Tire and they uh, they previewed the show on one of their episodes and then they they do a, like a five minute in depth focus uh, once a, a month on a show that you, that's like a, you know this is our pick show for the month or whatever you know however you want to sure. call it. And so they they put this together. So it includes a little bit of interview and a bunch of uh, imagery of of the space. So uh, let's see if I can get this to you. Share screen. I think uh, this is it. 
So if it, if uh, it has audio, sometimes you have to also say yeah, share my computer yeah, audio or something. I, I think I'm getting to be pretty good at this at this point. <laughs> okay, so, so this is a uh, this is their five minute tour. So I'll I'll be back. I'll, I'll see you in five minutes. Let's see. Put it full screen. Je kan niet het start worden gebracht. Probeer het nogmaals. De connectie kan niet be established. Please try again. Hi, I'm John Rivette. I am the art program director at West Texas A&M University. Um, today, I have with me Lee Ronaldo and Leah Singer. We're here to talk about their show. Yesterday was a year ago. I don't want a future, I want a present. One of the unique things about this show is it sort of made the gallery come alive. And it's one of these things that's been really fascinating as the show has kind of developed. We have eight projectors going in the gallery and four monitors. Almost so all of the quite a, have their own soundtrack. So Almost the all of the projectors have their own soundtrack. So the light room is very, a very immersive experience. And light, it's a very immersive experience. We kind of gave ourselves the parameter of March 2020 to March 2021 as a way to call all of our imagery and sounds that we've collected in that period and present a show that is really not a pandemic show, but is defined by that one year. look at uh, what we gathered in the last year. The idea was to have all of these independent loops. You walk into the gallery on two different days and you could get a completely different feeling. There's never a moment where the same images are up on all the screens or the same audio is playing against each other. It's very much an environmental installation and that was one of the things we wanted out of it. This flow of this flow these sounds of and images sounds that we gathered that we gathered in the last, in the last year. year. Putting the show together was almost cathartic. It was kind of a memory palace. The show is everything that was in our minds for the last year. I think a lot of people in this period became somewhat nostalgic for their former selves and their former lives. The large, the large wall has, has four, four projections on it. On it. Um, all, all overlaps in all, all different aspects, aspects all ratios, different aspect uh, ratios uh, happening. This is a place where there's this all is these a place where there's on all these different images on top of each other. The title of the show was something that really struck me because yesterday was a year ago. I've never had a year that had such a clean parentheses around it. These two screens share imagery, but they're not coordinated. The images are all cycling against each other and creating different uh, diptych poems, you know, all the time. The title is part Lee's and part mine. We both independently were trying to think of titles and then Lee said, well, you know, what about yesterday was a year ago? And I had, I don't want a future, I want a present. 
we ended up combining them because we like them both. Yes. They kind of yes. work well together. And they cover everything. Today, tomorrow, yesterday. <laughs> you can't really imagine the future right now. I don't think you can have a five-year plan right now. Okay, uh, let's see. I don't know why it was, uh, there was like a doubling of the voice at some points there. I'm not sure if I was playing it twice at the same time or, or what was happening there. But that's sort of, sort of a quick overview of, of what the show was like. And, you know, we've actually had a bunch of interest from different places, uh, some other uh, countries that were interested in, in mounting this show after seeing it. And so we put together like a web page and a little portfolio and and we're still sort of playing around with the format and, ex and expanding it. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to mount it again in a couple places and, and ex expand it a little bit. Oh, can I not hear you? Are you, are you muted, Mitch? I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. Sorry. No, I, I, I was muted because my cats were climbing around and stuff. Oh, same here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I thought was really interesting what you just said, or, or a few things I wanted to follow up was, well, one, you know, that'd be great if it's shown again, because I could see it. But I, I was thinking it was actually, it may be, and I'm not trying to be Pollyannish, but the fact that you were able to sort of pivot and make this show versus say the original idea of the recording out of Amarillo Ramp sort of allowed you to almost make sort of this personal, very sort of recent sort of statement about what's going on with your work and things. So it was it allowed that sort of unexpected thing to happen. Yeah, I mean, given what's happened this past year and, and uh, how it's affected everyone, the, 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 the opportunity to utilize, you know, our thoughts, our, our images and our sounds from this last year in, in a focused way was, was pretty, pretty good. I mean, it was pretty helpful to us to be able to package all that stuff and really try and get a grip on it in a certain way and see, and see it, you know, I mean, I was saying this last night that um, in spite of all the tragedy of this last year, I know a lot of uh, artists and creative people who said that this was a great year for them because they were able to work almost uninterruptedly, you know, no social events, no, no travels or, or getting on planes every other week or whatever, just sort of concentrated work. So a lot of people, um, I don't know if I put myself in that category or not, because I went through months of just pretty much doing nothing, sitting around waiting to figure out what was going to happen. But I, a lot of people, I think, got got really concerted work done. And I guess, in a way, this was our chance to utilize a lot of the stuff that we collected over the past year. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and, and also, for I, I started thinking a little about Smithson in that show. And it, it was the fact that you couldn't go there. It sort of created this sort of site, non-site sort of situation for you personally, sort of. You definitely. Know? Very definitely. And then that was on my mind too, you know, in this year, um, there's three uh, Smithson sites that are still around. Spiral Jetty out in Utah, where I was uh, in the early 2000s uh, to visit, and uh, Amarillo Ramp, which I finally got to visit a year and a half ago. And the third one is in Holland, it's called Broken Circle Spiral Hill, and it's in M in Holland, and it's, uh, it was made in it was made in 1971 for an art fair up there, and then the, the local community liked it so much that they decided to keep it. And uh, this year, 2021, would be its 50th anniversary. And I had plans with the Holt Smithson estate to, to write a big musical piece for, their, for the site. And actually, it was the first of his sites that I saw when, when Sonic Youth was on tour in, in Europe in the early 80s. In 1983, we went uh, you know, I knew where it was. You couldn't really find it. It was kind of like, uh, you know, somebody draws you a treasure map kind of thing. Like we were driving around these streets in the town and narrowing it down. And finally, we found it right at dusk. And you had to sneak through this gate and, and go out to see it. And so we saw it in 1983 when it was in a really disheveled state. It had been left unattended for basically a decade. And it was kind of falling apart and, and kind of a mess. It was still pretty incredible to see it. By the time we found it, the light was, it was the end of the afternoon and it was getting dark. And 
So it wasn't that easy to really figure out what it was. And um, so we went back a couple of years later in 1985 and saw it again. And at that point, uh, the town had restored it and it was it looked brand new. It looked exactly like it looks in the photographs that that when Smithson first made it for the exhibition. Um, and I guess they've kind of kept it up ever since. So the last trip I took in uh, February of last year, right before everything locked down, I was in Holland to do a couple performances and um, I arranged with the Holt Smithson estate and with this European agency called the Land Art Contemporary to go out and, and visit the site for a third time. And that's when we were really planning that I was going to come back and, you know, bring a whole bunch of musicians. It's, it's out in a big landscape. So, you're, you know, we planned uh, this piece with musicians kind of dotted around this landscape in little groves of trees and here and there. And I was kind of working on a piece for the to celebrate the 50th anniversary. You, you know, the idea at that point was I was going to go out to Amarillo Ramp and film this piece in a very private way, just me and, and the film crew and, and my friend John. And that was really just for the cameras and for for me, basically, to be able to perform this piece out at, at Amarillo Ramp. And, and in contrast, the idea at Broken Circle Spiral Hill was that it was going to be a public event, like 50th anniversary of this large land art piece. Lots of people would be there. There'd be lots of musicians. It was going to be a very different, uh, you know, kind of like the opposite side of the coin. But it still hasn't happened, and it's still something that's on hold until we figure out. I mean, maybe it'll happen in 2022 at this point is kind of what we're thinking. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. I, I, I'd spend a lot of time and and another one so it'd be fun to, to see that happen so yeah. i was actually i was sort of curious about so you I, i'm fascinated that you're able to see it sort of in its sort of entropic state you know before it was sort of restored because that's yeah. something i always think about is what would you know i don't know if smith have left directions for his sort of for these projects and you know if he wants them to be because amarillo ramp is sort of you know is eroding back into the landscape in a very sort of smithson way right it it is very much so um let me see if I can just share my screen for one second. I don't, I'm not always good at all this tech. But what, do, what do you feel about them restoring the-, the, the Well, the, you know, it's, it's an interesting issue because um, uh, he didn't really leave uh, in instructions uh, for, for this kind of stuff. And uh, Amarillo Ramp, uh, I'll probably never find it, but I have pictures of Amarillo <laughs> yeah. Ramp in its pristine state. And, and where it is today. I mean, no, no matter, we don't have to go there. But um, so what was your reaction seeing it seeing it both ways? I'm curious, your 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 take on it, seeing well, it. Well, you know, the the first time that we went there, uh, it was, you know, it's, 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 it's like its title, it's a broken circle, half of the, there's a jetty going out into the water and a jetty of water going into the land. And then there's a hill with a spiral path going going up it. And um, the um, the the hill was all overgrown and you, the path was invisible and part of the jetty going out into the water was had fallen apart so that it was broken into a few different sections so it was in a pretty decrepit state I mean it was still kind of amazing because it was obvious that you know humans had kind of terraformed the land to make this art piece there mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting to come back two years later and see it in a, in its beautiful state where the path you know, when Smithson originally created it, he used some kind of white chalky substance on the path up the hill. So it had this kind of like white linear path going spiraling up this hill to the top. And when you stood at the top, you kind of had an overview of the whole landscape and it was back in its in its form like that. And right now, Amarillo Ramp, you know, which when it was originally formed, it had really hard shoulders and it was really, you know, geometric shape. And now everything's kind of rounded off and bushes and plants and flowers have grown up around it. Uh, my friend John and his students kind of go out there once a year and do a little bit of um, maintenance on, on the site. They pull out any big bushes that are growing on the sides of it. So it still kind of keeps its shape, although it's getting softer and softer. And you know, the, the thing about it that's amazing, and this is kind of similar to Spiral Jetty. When you come to Spiral Jetty, you kind of come over a crest of a hill and then you kind of see it out out on the lake and it's pretty impressive. And the, the piece in Texas, because it's kind of 
been overgrown, you, you also come kind of over a rise and you see it, but it's almost hard to find at first because it's the same color as this giant landscape. And, you know, you, you kind of have your eyes have to orient to really see it because it's not as starkly defined as it as it once was. You know, um, another piece of Smithson's that he made in the early 70s in uh, in, Ohio, in Ohio at Kent State called Partially Buried Woodshed. Yeah. where you know he did a lot of things that at the time were not necessarily seen as art and you know this may be uh you know this is early 70s but you could almost look at this as an antecedent of sort of punk art practice where you know he did a lot of stuff that at the time people just scratched their heads and wondered what it was and this this piece at Kent State was like that he he'd been fascinated with this idea of things deteriorating and uh he, they uh, he went there to do some exhibition and he wanted to make a piece there. And at that point, uh, Kent State campus was rather small, but they owned a lot of land and he found on a dis disused part of the, the campus, this old woodshed. And he wanted to pile dirt on top of it until the central beam in the in the structure cracked. And as soon as the, the beam cracked, the you know, he was going to stop work and just leave it in that state. And he did that and they piled like, I don't know, 20 dump trucks full of earth on top of this little wooden shed. And finally, the, the, the massive central beam started to, you know, bend in and, and finally it cracked in half. The thing didn't collapse, but it just stood there. And, you know, for, as far as he was concerned, that was the piece and, you know, they left. And, you know, as the campus expanded, they wanted to use that land and uh, they were like, you know, what is this? heap of rubble here you know why are some people calling this art when it's really kind of this eyesore and they didn't really know what to do because the piece was falling apart but it you know there were there were curators and scholars coming who said like this is important you need to you need to preserve this you know so what they did was they planted trees all around it that grew up and kind of hit it basically <laughs> rather than taking it down and over time, at one point, well, uh, this was like a year before the, the, the shootings at Kent State, you know, during the Vietnam right. War protests. And during those shootings, uh, I forget if that was, I forget what year the shootings were, May 1970 or 71, 71 maybe? Right, that's right. Um, but somebody spray painted on the big beam across the, 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 the woodshed, you know, May 1970 or something like that. And all of a sudden it took on this other context of being not just this broken uh, shed for Smithson's piece, but it took on almost like the element of a, a memorial to the kids who died on campus that day shot by the National Guard. And so it had even, it, it accrued sort of an almost un, uh, unplanned uh, additional um, gravitas, I guess you would say. And so they, they did sort of put these trees around it and leave it. And it's slowly gone back to the land. There was a fire at one point. And at this point, all that's left is a little um, cement framework of the foundation. The rest of the entire structure is gone. The mound of dirt has become like gra a grassy hill there. And, and um, you know, so it's now, it's, it's now a real non-site. You know, it's a non-site on the site of the site in, in a sense. I mean, there was an artwork that he created there and and you could almost say that as that site evolves it's it's the continuing story of of that artwork that he made there but you know it's very conceptual at this point and there's nothing right. really there to see but a little you know six inch uh, stone foundation that traces the the perimeter of the building yeah something i want to follow up on that is uh, a couple of things one of my students is sort of looking at midwest post-punk and he has a story that he's trying to research is supposedly sort of Devo, some members from Devo were at Kent State when that happened. And so there's this interesting sort of history from narrative is like, you know, you know, was what 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 happened at Kent State? Was there some sort of, you know, did that then lead to sort of this idea of sort of de-evolution? You know, were they did they have some sort of personal reaction to the sort of national trauma, right? And Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. I didn't. I never heard before that some of those guys were there. But that that's that is an interesting uh, story. If if that's the case, Cleveland and Akron and and Ohio in general was really important in that early the early days of the punk scene. There was it was one of the other cities where really interesting stuff was happening between Devo and Perubu and uh, Rocket uh, from the Tombs. You know, Peter Lochner and all of that kind of stuff that was happening out there was was really. Uh, 
maybe, you know, for the people in New York in that period of time that were doing music, like the early days of television and things like that, 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 that would, there was a lot of connection with what was going on out in Ohio. So there, I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, art practice ideas trading, trading back and forth as well. Um, and so uh, going back a little bit to your Texas show, it was, it's been interesting because you use media and then we've, a lot of us have only experienced it through media, like through the internet or Instagram or, you know, whatever, Facebook, or through a Zoom, we're watching a video on a video. Yeah. Um, it's getting a little metaphysical. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of curious, you know, because for most of us, you know, we only saw or know of the earthworks through a mediated experience, you know, through for photos. You know, I, I first knew really about Spiral Jetty because I had, a you know, someone in my college art, you know, the, one of the librarians pulled out a 16 millimeter film of Spiral Jetty and sat yeah. me down and said, I could, you know, here, watch it, you know, and I got to watch it and I got to hear the tape get caught up and ruined in the projector. <laughs> um, but so I'm curious for you. So you probably saw all these works, right? And, you know, going way back to like college or whatever. And then you slowly were able to visit those sites. So like you had something in your head yeah. and then you visited these sites. So it was very personal. And then you had this personal and person experience. Were you, were you in some ways, how did you, were you let down? I mean, what, were you excited? I mean, what was your sort of response and going from the mediated experience to the real experience? Well, I mean, it was it was very exciting because, you know, um, Smithson doesn't really talk about it in, in these terms, but, you know, a lot of, um, um, I don't know, either like Native American or spiritualist uh, tracks tend to talk about like power spots, power places, you know, that there are certain places on on the planet that have something going on where the 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 lines of radiation cross or you know however you want to frame it and in a way he almost defined a, a situation like that just by activating these these places out in the landscape you know and the funny thing for me was i really you know i guess i'd heard about spiral jetty but when i first moved to new york someone handed me the first edition of his book of writings and his his uh, his collected writings are just remarkable to read um, yeah. they they were a take on you know and again this is this is really a, you know early 70s this is an antecedent to 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 what was happening with punk in new york city in terms of sort of a both a tearing down and a rebuilding of a lot of our concepts of some of these practices he was looking at art practice through a wholly uh, radical and innovative innovative new new way um he was you know he was a kid who grew up uh reading science fiction and going to the american museum of natural history and seeing those old bones on display and all those dioramas and things and being fascinated by all that stuff and really um bringing all these things elements of science fiction and and like science fantasy and and old geological historical exhibits from these dusty museums from the 40s and 50s and kind of recombining them in interesting ways and his his writings were just remarkable and they really opened my head up in a lot of ways to all these ideas of conceptual thinking like you know he took trips to mexico with a bunch of mirrors and set the mirrors up and and made these photographs where part of what you're looking at like you were saying the the meta of the meta you know videos of videos you know you were looking at something and then the mirrors were reflecting something that was off screen back onto the screen. You know, he was really playing around with a lot of interesting concepts. And Pl Planke was actually, a, I think a lecture he gave at Yale. It was like a fake, it was like a fake lecture about architecture. Yeah. yeah they took it, seri they took it seriously. <laughs> he did a lecture about these ruins in Mexico that he found in this town called Palenque. And he did a whole like slideshow, like hour long lecture that's been preserved. I mean, you can, you can watch it. Um, and he, you know, he did a, it was sort of a fake lecture about like just a, a nondescript site of a, you know, a town that like was abandoned or whatever. And he, he, he talked about it as though he was uh, giving an architectural tour of like a, a you know, a, an Inca site or something like that, you know, exactly. deep history when he was really just, just kind of making it up. Um, but uh, so when I finally saw the sites, I had all of that in my head of his writings and this kind of visionary way that he thought about what he was doing when he actually started having the opportunity to build these works. And so th they were magnificent, you know, coming upon them out in the landscape, someone who reshaped uh, the land like that was, you know, was, was really magnificent. 
Yeah. And you know, where Amarillo is, there's there's a little collection of 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 land art pieces out there, which are so there. You know, besides uh, Amarillo Ramp, there's a there's a there's a famous piece. Let me see if I can uh, show you a few pictures while we talk here. There's a famous piece by this uh, California collective called Ant Farm. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That have this uh, piece called the Cadillac Ranch, and it's these buried uh, these buried uh, Cadillac uh, cars out in the landscape there. Oh, here, here. Let's see if I can find it here. Just bear with me for a second. Let's see where we are here. Well, okay. So I'll just show you a few things here, if I can. Uh, I'll show them to you like this right now. That's uh, Amarillo Ramp when it was first created. So you can see it's really sharp and the desert was really dry. And, you know, this is, again, these pieces change with the seasons, you know? So like here, here's Amarillo Ramp nearly uh, the way it is today. So it's a very different experience. And this was uh, done in the, you know, I was there in the spring. So, you know, there were wildflowers growing everywhere and the desert was kind of all these multicolors. And like I said, my, my friend John and his students kind of keep the grass and the bushes off the, the piece itself. So you can still kind of see the shape of, of, of the outline of it. But um, so here's the Cadillac Ranch, which is uh, also uh, well, here's I'll just show you a couple other things here. I hope you guys can see this stuff. Yeah. So here's when they were right after they constructed it at the time the basin was filled with water they had to they started draining it. But um, when it was first constructed it also had this relationship both to broken circle spiral hill and spiral jetty in that it was a jetty that had water around it in, in an interesting way. Um, there was a dam that they they broke through to um, this is you know Smithson died in a plane crash. Um, while at the site and this is him in the plane a couple days before where the first time they went up to uh, to film it with that's stanley marsh the guy that owned the ranch in in front of him in the center of the picture and i guess the pilot is the guy with the little hat on that's stanley marsh right there with him when smithson is had chosen the site and he basically just sketched in the in the sand with his finger what he wanted to do there uh, but here's cadillac ranch which is nearby in amarillo it's right on the side of uh route 80 if you're driving west i first saw this in 1974 after high school i took a cross-country trip with a buddy of mine and we were driving by it on route 80 like what what's going on here with all these cars and this is a, a san francisco collective called ant farm that that put these cars here and over time they've become covered you know once upon a time they looked like cadillacs and now they look uh, you know they're all covered in, in graffiti uh, but it's it's still kind of cool to come upon them out in the landscape, and th this is another piece that's out there. I can't remember the artist name who did this, but it's called. This is a uh, maybe I'll have to skip a couple of pictures, but this is a side view. But he constructed, as you see at the top of that mesa, this kind of white fence around it. And when you see it from the front, let me see if I've got the front pictures. It's there. It's called floating mesa. And it's supposed to look like the top of it is actually hovering above the uh, above the the flat mesa there. Well, I thought I had well, I thought I had some more pictures of it, but maybe maybe I don't. Uh, so that that's that's it. But it's it's another really uh, interesting interesting piece that's that's out there in that landscape. Here's uh, here's Broken Circle Spiral Hill, the first or in 1985 when we went there. See what I was talking about? That part of it that goes out into the water was all kind of broken up and 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 kind of a, a mess. Um, I like and, it though; it's awesome. Yeah, and this is I think <laughs> from the first trip when we were there. So the hill was all overgrown with these uh, some kind of shrubbery. I can't can't yeah. remember exactly. Uh, this is the gate you had to go through, and it says in Dutch, you know, no trespassing. I guess something like that, but. Uh, so it looks like an old quarry site, maybe too. Or it know. was a quarry. It was definitely a quarry site, and and uh, it was it's a disused quarry for many years now. But so this is how it looks now. I think these are oh, okay. contemporary, or maybe not exactly contemporary, but that's how it looked when he built it with this kind of white path, and the hill was really clean, and now it's all uh, overgrown with. Uh, you can see it there at the top of the lake. Uh, so this was an entire quarry site, and you can see the, the jetty uh, sticking out into the water there, a little circular thing 
right right in the center there. There, there. So it's interesting when you were talking, oh, there's a, there's some sketches of it. Yeah, yeah, these were before he created it. This was done for, a, for an art fair, you know, an early version of kind of an art fair uh, out there. And, you know, he was playing. And this was actually, this is interesting because one of the things we did in our show was Lee has been using a lot of negative imagery. So here he's, he, he made photos with this stuff. I didn't even put this together at the time until right now, but he made a lot of weird negative photos of, of, of the work, uh, of this work. You, you see a lot of uh, negative uh, images from him of it. And, and Leah used a lot of negative uh, imagery in our show, you know, just part of the idea of this, this last year was turning things uh, negative as a way of, I don't know, sort of grappling with a certain aspect of uh, what went on this last year. The other interesting thing about, here's a picture of Smithson standing by one of these uh, dolmens, which is another kind of ancient uh, ritualistic spot. You know, you could, obviously he would have been gravitated towards these. And, and interestingly, the area around uh, spiral, uh, Broken Circle Spiral Hill, I don't know if I have any pictures of it, but it's filled with, yeah, here's, it's filled with these Viking burial uh, sort of dolmens, they call them in Dutch hunter beds, but there were all these uh, sites like dotting the landscape nearby to, to, to uh, Broken Circle Spiral Hill. Uh, so it was interesting that Smithson chose uh, this site to build his own sort of version of a ritualistic uh, spot because uh, the, the landscape already had uh, stuff like this uh, there, you know. And these days they've built a little, there's a little shed with all these, uh, these kind of photos and like the history of the site is uh, there's, there's a, you know, if you go there, there's a little like visitor's center. Um, okay, I don't think there's- I'm so glad you're showing this imagery because we, we didn't go anywhere in this in depth into his work. So this is, this is really- Oh, perfect. okay, good, good, good. This is really, good. really helpful. Yeah, so there's a, there's a little, uh, here's, here's uh, the, 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 the person from Land Art Contemporary on that path going up to up the spiral hill. And, you know, when you get up to the top of it, you really get this amazing, impressive uh, view of the landscape. I don't know what I've got here. I, I don't have these very well organized, uh, but uh, there's a kind of visitor's center there with historic photos and, and actually some of his drawings. Uh, that's, that's somebody's painting of the site on the side of this visitor center. Um, it's so great going back to Holland in this class because our very first guest lecture was a, a John Cage specialist from Amsterdam. Oh, so it's it's nice we're coming sort of full circle. Well, that's here. interesting because we we last night we were talking a lot about Cage because at some point Sonic Youth did uh, Cage music uh, as part of this project we did called Goodbye Twentieth Century, um, and uh, so we we were talking about about Cage. Here's here's a. Uh, I mean, you, you guys have probably seen images of, of Spiral Jetty, but, uh, you know. Uh, no, this is perfect. Thank you. Yeah, here, here's when I went there in, I don't know, 2004 or something like that. Uh, it was, there was water in between, you know, sometimes it dries up, but uh, there was, you know, everything is covered with salt crystals. It looks like snow, but it's really the crystals of the, the lake is so incredibly saline that the salt, uh, when it when it evaporates, these are some pictures of uh, of Nancy Holt's sun tunnels, which is nearby in, in Utah, which, you know, I won't really go into, but, you know, uh, these lines on the inside of them are, you know, uh, people would go out there and shoot rifles, and I think they're the traces of bullets going, whizzing through the, the these they are, yeah. tunnels. You know, she had uh, uh, cut constellation, uh, the 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 marks are the, the star the, the the little holes in the tunnels line up with constellations as well as the the four tunnels line up with the solstice uh this was a book that was really important to smithson at the time the shape of time by george kubler like a uh like a real historical perspective on on art and time that you know smithson uh, one of the interesting things about about his work and i'll stop sharing my screen now is that um he was uh he brought a lot of uh, other than art direct art influences into his thinking and into his work he read a lot of archaeology and geology and and sort of and like i said before science fiction actually 
you know, a, a book by a, a science fiction author named Brian Aldiss is called Earthworks. And that partly spurred him on to this idea that he could build stuff out in the landscape like that, which was, you know, kind of interesting. I've got, I've got an original edition of that. Of Earthworks? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's I, I, tracked, I have a whole library of dismissed and related stuff. <laughs> yes, same here, same here. I've only ever seen the sort of the dime store paperback versions of that book that has like a, you know, like a cover with rocket ships or something on, on it. That, that's a book he mentions as he's taking the bus out to Passaic for the tour of the monuments. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So what I so like you, I'm like you know this unrepentant sort of fan of Smithson, but it's you know it's been interesting the last you know five years, especially the last year, as we're sort of like you know decolonizing our minds in some ways, you know. So I'm not in any way trying to cancel anything, but you know it has made me think though, like you know my heroes are these like white dudes leaving New York to go out west and build these huge pieces on somebody else's land, right and and it's been interesting for me, at least, to sort of, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not canceling it. I'm just trying to reconcile it or rethink it. So like, you know, because there's that famous Mark Tansley painting of the indigenous people from that area overlooking sort mm -hmm. of uh, overlooking Spiral Jetty. And it's quite a political comment, really. And yeah. we don't, and, you know, Smithson wasn't necessarily a political artist in any way, but it's, it is interesting to sort of think about these projects that were out West and you know, someone who was a New York artist sort of moving out there and, and to sort of you know, wonder now in sort of this context, you know, could he make these works today or, you know, or would that be considered you know, insensitive? Because you know, in, in, the, in the late early 70s, late 60s, you know, it was a different frame of mind, right? You know, These topics weren't in the forefront and they weren't necessarily on people's minds. And you know, everything that's happened you know, especially in the kind of the crucible of the last year, th these are going to reshape our thoughts about all of this stuff, you know, racial demographics and, and, you know, whose land are we actually on, you know, all of this, all of these things were not really, um, uh, you know, in the forefront of people's minds at that, at that point in time. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, tricky situation to figure out whether you fall, you know, like they're taking Abraham Lincoln's name off schools and you know all that stuff. I mean, you know, there's all um, there's all degrees of this stuff. And I think it's really important to recognize the, the rights and the wrongs of some of our former heroes, you know, and, and acknowledge it. But I think you also have to acknowledge that, you know, people's thinking is, is moving into the into the future at this point, and we're going to reassess all of this stuff based on that, you know. Uh, whose land uh, we're all on is 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 a is a big issue that you know kind of uh, almost supersedes uh, or or you know it's is separate it's part of the whole racial issue that's that's in the you know in the in the, in our minds these days and in the news um you know another artist that uh, I'm really involved in is a Canadian pop artist named Greg Kerno and he was um he's a really interesting character he was maybe you would say Canada's uh, foremost pop artist at a certain point. And he, like Smithson, died tragically young. He was, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a cyclist, as you mentioned earlier, and Kerno was also a cyclist, big time cyclist. And he actually made a lot of artworks. He painted crazy pictures on plexiglass of his bicycles, and he did a lot of uh, images of the bicycle wheel with all the spokes and stuff. And it was one aspect of what he did was he has some imagery that has, has bicycles in it. But so he was a cyclist. He was also a musician and he was a founding member of this crazy uh, troupe out of this is a uh, London, Ontario, like an hour outside of Toronto. Um, he was the founding member and drummer of this group called the, the Nihilist Spasm Band, who were a, a collective of uh, crazy, they were all artists and they were all improvisers and they did a weekly session in this gallery in London that, you know, they started like 40 years ago and they're still going today. When, you know, when Sonic Youth was still around, we played shows with them and they, they toured Japan and they played in New York and, you know, they're old men now, but they're, they're, they've got this legendary long career and Greg was their drummer founder. Um, 
and he he was tragically killed in a bicycle accident by a driver that came over a hill with the sun in his eyes and plowed into this group of riders uh, sort of tragically but one of the last things he did one of the last major works he did you know he when he was a young artist and he first came into a little bit of money he bought a property in london like a a house on a couple acres or or whatever and um towards the end of now towards the end of his life he got interested in whose land he was on like whose land you know because canada's really involved in first nations and and you know they're really they've been much more aware of it longer than we have and so he started digging through historical records and he created these pieces that were mostly like books, I guess, these kind of abstracts where he del- delved down as deep as he could go into the land he was on. And he found all the original deeds. And then he, you know, he did all this research trying to figure out like, well, you know, whose land am I on and who really owns this land? It was pretty fascinating, very, um, very abstract in the sense that it mostly the, the, the work he produced were a couple books, book length you know projects full of text basically talking about his discoveries of of uh the land he was on and how it how it uh, came to be in the hands of these white men you know and how he came you know <laughs> hundreds of years later to purchase it you know as a, as an you know unassuming you know sort of young artist basically pretty fascinating stuff but he was really an early um uh early uh early to the game on on this notion of uh you know Whose land are we actually on? And that's Greg Corno, you said? Greg Kerno, C R N O E. Really, really interesting artist. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought I thought we could um, take some uh, questions from the students if we want to at this point. Sure. It'd be, be really sure. helpful. But I, I just before we go into that, I just you know I think it's I I, pre, I think you're spot on when you sort of look at Smith and I think you can sort of see. What he did in his career, you know, in the late, you know, basically late '60s, uh, early '70s, and dying at uh, 35, you know, for me, it's a sort of very clear precedent in terms of his his attitude, um, his you know, his his willingness to experiment, his sort of intellectual, you know, curiosity. That he's a very strong sort of I would call sort of like a, you know. He's a, you know, I, I can see him very much influencing what happened in the post-punk scene, aesthetics and sort of no wave and, um, you know, all of his work dealing with sort of entropy. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, it's, you know, it's not just the visuals, but I think um, his writings, like as you said, you know, his writings have really, are really standing the test of time. And to me, they're, they're almost like reading writings, the, you know, the, the textual equivalent of what you can maybe hear and some of the stuff that's happening, like with say Sonic Youth or you know, th- these bands coming out of that time. You know, did you feel that affinity? I'm just curious, like with his Well, I suppose I did. It, it's really it would be it's really interesting to speculate, you know, what would have happened to him had he lived longer, because um he basically died at the very beginning stages of punk, you know. I mean, uh and he was you know, he was a, a nerd and an intellectual, but he was also a real scenester. Like he was hanging out at Max's, at Max's Kansas City and, um, you know, sort of mixing with the Warhol crowd. And, and uh, you know, he shows up in a lot of, uh, you know, there's a big uh, show by Alice Neal right now here at the Metropolitan Museum. And she has a painting of Smithson uh, right. from, from the late 60s or early 70s. And uh, the, one of Warhol's superstars, Bridget Berlin, I went to see a show of her Polaroid photos from the 60s and 70s. And, you know, she's got photos of Smithson, like he was definitely around on the scene, like hanging out at Max's when the Velvet Underground were playing and all that stuff. So he was, he straddled a bunch of worlds because he wasn't, you know, the art world kind of looked suspiciously at him at the time because he was bringing all these uh, other than, you know, the the contemporary practice right then was for these very con- conceptual art writings and things and he was writing about science fiction and and you know old rocks and things like that and and putting it you know bringing rocks into the gallery actually with those non sites that he did so i mean i think he would have had a great affinity for the the rise of of the sort of punk and no wave music that was happening in new york at that time it's it's you know it's we can only speculate uh where he would have gone from there you know the other thing which i don't know if you've talked about this but if you you know when you talk about smithson's work it's almost inevitable that you talk about he was really an early um 
he came early to the idea of like, you know, he, these sites, he was working in abandoned quarries and sites that had been sort of strip mined and, and left for dead, basically. And he was all about reclaiming these sites in a very uh, ecological sense, you know, taking sites that were kind of ruined and transforming them back into, you know, simply by bestowing an artwork on them practically transforming like a ruined quarry into a into a public park in a sense and and he was really interested in this idea of you know like you've got he he did a project that never was realized for an airport in Texas where you know it was just a big ugly scar on the landscape and he was trying to figure out how you could kind of you know turn something ugly into something you know with beautiful even if it's just conceptually through like somehow calling it art or, or readjusting some things to make it an artwork and uh that was pretty interesting because he was really aware of the fact that we that he wanted to work in abandoned sites and, and reclaim them in some way yeah i though that's important to note that he did often you know like to work in these sites that were basically our forefathers of like super fun sites or epa polluted sites yeah but the yeah, epa yeah. didn't really exist then so <laughs> um so a lot of things he wants to do today you know they wouldn't let him do because of that but um you know i i i think you know we don't know where he was going but i i always like to think that you know in 72 he wrote that article about central park and frederick law homestead the frederick law homestead and the dialectical landscape yeah to me that's i mean that i that was like the first sort of thing that i really latched onto with his work and his writings and to me, it's and I revisit that article like with my classes and on my own, like almost you know several times a year. Yeah. To me, that sort of paints a picture of what he thought he might be able to move, where he was sort of going with his career potentially, and just in his very sort of in, you know his, his incredible insights in that article about you know everything he was like sort of comparing sort of what he was trying to do with his work, what Olmsted tried to do with his work, sort of with this like what he called this more sort of emotional or not emotional, sorry. Um, a little bit, he, he called it sort of, a, um, I think he said like things like it was anemic or uh, responses. I think he was sort of comparing his work with like people like um, uh, this book, uh, um, Greening of America or sort yeah. of, I think he's sort of poking a little bit sort of at hippie culture a bit sort of when he's saying, you know, that, that, that they're sort of out of touch with sort of the sort of actual mechanics and physicality of the earth and sort of and are sort of romanticizing the sort of pure nature and he doesn't he didn't want to romanticize a pure nature he was he, i don't even, you know he, i think he was very much into the idea of sort of contamination and sure looking at the actual nature in, in and sort of, yeah so celebrating the reality of that sort of and he was trying to in some ways actually break down that binary of nature and culture and try to see how humans are sort of part of geology right and all that yeah yeah i mean that that is an important article and you know i mean these days uh Frederick Law Olmsted is, you know, is hailed as this great visionary, you know, for the, especially for the designs for Central Park and Prospect Park out in Brooklyn. And um, I've got to reread that uh, essay because I cycle in the park all the time and it'd probably be a good time for me to reread it. But at that time, I think the art world thought that this was like kind of wacky that he was talking about the, the public park and, you know, the design of a park that was built 150 years ago in the context of contemporary art. Um, so, you know, he, he was definitely ahead of, ahead of the curve, uh, there too. Well, I can, I can give you a homework assignment, Lee. This is a, <laughs> this is a picture he, he took in 72, a year before he died of these steps that Olmsted carved in the geology in the park. Mm -hmm. it's, it's right. It's near the South, one of the South entrances. It's a fun, it's a fun, um, uh, you can actually find other pictures of this that show some of the, the buildings in the background. A couple of years ago, I gave myself a, you know, I went on this sort of like a, you know, treasure hunt. Treasure hunt, and I found all these pictures and reshot them. Oh, cool! And I, I, I did the same thing in Passaic in like 1990, and I found really? a lot of the original ruins. And I even talked to people that Smithson writes about in that article. Really? And I, I, I took all the, I rephotographed everything, and I even interviewed the people, and I wrote an article about it. I, I can send that on to you. Please do. I'd love to see that. Yeah, it was, it was because actually some of the stuff was still there. It was pretty cool to take pictures of it. But it was very it took me like three days to figure out what was what sort of and mm -hmm. um but uh so so um so one, one thing i wanted to I, I sorry i know the students are asking some questions but i just sort of curious i know you were you were probably about 17 when smithson died and you probably weren't even at college yet was it was it in college was it an art school you went to art school right is that i did i, I went to the state university in binghamton up uh about three hours north of here and uh, i studied painting and printmaking there 
Oh, great. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, um, actually, uh, after we saw, say goodbye, I'm going to the print shop for the first time in a year and pulling some new prints today. Oh, where are you going? Where are you printing? I'm just curious. There's a place here in Midtown Manhattan called uh, Bob Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. And it's been there forever. When I was in school, my uh, my print teacher, Linda Sokolowski, always said like, well, someday you'll move to New York and you'll work at Blackburn's place. And, and you know, indeed, yeah. over the last few years, I, I've been making prints there. I, I print, uh, I do works printed on old, you know, I, I make uh, dry points on old vinyl records and make these, this, I've been working on this series of, uh, of dry points on vinyl uh, for the, you know, since, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now, I've been kind of working on them. So I, I, I scratched up a bunch of records and I'm going to go up there today and, and pr proof some new, some new play. Oh, well, that's awesome. And of course, I mean, I know Blackburn very well and, you know, two palms and places like that in New York. So you yeah, know, incredible histories there unto themselves. Yeah, amazing yeah. histories, and we know I know some people who work at those places too, or oh, you know, cool. technicians there. Yeah. So, so, so when did you did you hear about Smithson in college, or was it was it you know, or when you got to New York? How did that happen? I'm just sort of curious on that on your sort of experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I was I was in in art college from uh, in the late seventies, from seventy four to seventy eight, and or seventy nine, and. Um, you know, so Spiral Jetty was built in the early 70s. So, you know, it was definitely filtering into discussions. My my school was not very conceptually bent. It was really, uh, you know, one of the the painting, the main painting teacher, Angelo Apollito, was kind of a second generation abstract expressionist. He founded one of the first galleries on 10th Street in, in the 50s when there was that entire, uh, you know, 10th Street gallery scene going on there, uh, just as abstract expressionism was coming to the fore. And, you know, so it was really practical. There were, you know, we learned, we, we did drawing and we did printmaking and painting and sculpture, and it wasn't very conceptually bent, but I was really interested in that writing, maybe in part because growing up, I was really, in, I read a lot of science fiction. So Smithson's work, the fact that it touched on that, it was an easy avenue into uh, reading that stuff. And it, you know, it kind of had this, you know, sometime at, I think even more so in that period, if I picked up art form or something, some of the articles just felt like they were way over your head, like they were talking on such an abstract level. And and his writing was very un, uh, very easy to understand and and to to get inside of. And you know, and I think that's partly what brought me into it. It wasn't just you know intellectual mumbo jumbo. It kind of it had its own kind of. Uh, I don't know warmth to it. I guess no. I I completely agree. It had a very sort of analog quality to it, and and he was writing for Art Forum, so it was. I yeah. love that. I love that his yeah. voice was in Art Forum. Yeah, you know that's another thing about his work from that period. And there's there's other uh, artists who were doing the same thing, like a, a friend of mine who was at that time a friend of Smithson's, Dan Graham was also making, you know, Smithson's pieces for those magazines, he would send them the layout and be like, I want these photos here, you know, and, and really conceive, you know, so the, 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 his articles for those magazines are in a way artworks in themselves because he can see, it wasn't like he sent in the text and some editor at the magazine plugged in some pictures. He pretty much sent them laid out exactly as he wanted them. So even the, 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 the pages of the magazine became, uh, you know, in a sense, in his mind, you know, an artwork, you know, because uh, he was controlling how they were presented. And uh, Dan was another guy at that period that was doing the same thing, like sending magazines, uh, completely laid out articles that were very, con you know, sort of conceptual in their layout. Yeah, and I, I hold them up all the time to my students as, you know, the import, the, the incredible importance of writing. And, you know, I think for Smithson, there's a good chance his writings are going to really stand the test of time over even his his artwork, his drawings and sculptures. You know, yeah. they're just so they're so powerful. I mean, I I bought this book, this actual book at like Saint Mark Books in like probably '87 or something. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I was that's a, the original. Was a that's the original version. I have that copy too. It was later updated uh, in a, in a hardcover version, but that's, that's yeah, I, I probably have this in German too. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. And I have the original Italian poster here for Asphalt Rundown. Oh, oh, wow, cool. Yeah, and this is, uh, I told you about um, a broken, uh, this is from the island up here. And it's what? This is from his island that he owns in uh, Maine. Oh, the little, <laughs> little Fort Island. Yeah, I've been there a few times, but this is, the only, this is my only official Smithson. 
Okay. <laughs> well, I'll have to talk to you at a greater length about that at some point, some other point in time, because I know that the 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 uh, state just opened that island up to some artist projects. Right. Uh, yep. Smithson and Holt own that little island up there. And you know, the funny thing is, my connection to Maine is these days. I mean, I I've been to Mount Desert Island and all that years ago, but uh, one of my my son's friend's family owns a small island near Little Fort that is, it's, it's, theirs is the only house on this little tiny island. It's a really a little tiny island. You can walk the perimeter in like 45 minutes, I suppose. And uh, so we've been up there visiting a couple of times. And next time I go, I'd like to go from there to see Little Fort. Oh yeah, I, I have a lobster and it takes me out to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I have, a, I have like a whole bunch of facts as when drawings from Nancy Hold about Little Fort because we corresponded over the years about it. Oh, um, cool. So she's, she, and at one point I almost owned, had possession of that island because they went into the estate, went into, uh, they didn't pay their taxes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, somebody's got to save this for the estate, but they got the money and they bought it back. Um, so, yeah, so I, I appreciate all this a lot. And I think it'd be great for the students, you know, to, you know, I don't know what questions they necessarily have, but, you know, if they can, let's open up the floor and, uh, you know, just get away from us for a minute. And if you have more time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a little bit more time. I, I said yeah. I have to get to the studio in an hour or so. That's incredible. You're going there today. That's really, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that's um, so tell they, me a little bit about the program up there. Is it is it a practical program as well as conceptual? I mean, are are people painting? Are paint? Are are we painters? Or you know, what what are students doing? I'd be really curious to hear anybody. Yeah, to I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet. So uh, I'm gonna ask the students to answer that. Like, you know, what are you studying? You know, what are the different what are the type of curriculum they offer at Mecca? So please, uh, who wants to answer that for Lee? Like, what's Mecca like? Um, yeah, so I'm a graphic designer. I'm actually in the studio right now. Um, and there's a lot of like open studios and a lot of different things like different fine arts and craft arts. Um, and I think a lot of people would like to talk about the work they make too. Yeah, you so so that I was wondering why you had a mask on because you're in a public you're in a public place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool that the studios are open. Uh, yeah, it's really great. Have they have they been open all through this year or just recently or? Um, yeah, this year we have been open. Really? Wow, that's great. Because mm -hmm. that's been a hard thing, especially for art students. My, my younger son is an art student at Cornell and you know they closed the studios for this last year. So for people that need access to real uh, equipment or space to do yeah. stuff, it's been a really challenging year for students. Yeah, so Mecca, you know, they you can study sculpture there or dance, you know, or they have textiles, printmaking, you know, all the traditional arts. And then they also have, uh, you know, illustration and graphic design mm -hmm. uh, and academic studies. And then, um, and they even have a minor now in music and they have, they've, on the lower level, level a few years ago, they opened up a studio uh, and you can record and you learn recording. Uh, oh, cool. and so you can use that for your it kind of be for your sound art or for actual straight up just you know recordings or mm -hmm. um, different types of projects. And um, is there a gallery like where students exhibit and things like that? The ICA, yes. Okay, good. I, I was thinking maybe on one of your trips up here, we we'll, the ICA will have to have you do a performance in there, maybe with Leah or something. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> the other thing I was going to say about our our show in Texas. I mean, we've done a lot of different works with projection for installations before, never one with as many ex extensive projections as this one, but usually, and, and so, you know, that show was structured in a, in a particular way. Some of the screens, there were a pair of screens that were arranged as a diptych that really kind of related just back and forth with themselves. There was one uh, screen that was just a static, this kind of winter landscape low on the wall, like a, these Japanese windows that Leah was talking about. Uh, but uh, and and four screens together were kind of collagey all overlapping each other. But um, normally we would have shown up on opening day and done a performance live in the gallery where I'd be interacting with the, the screens. And, you know, I do this performance with my guitar suspended by a rope and sort of swinging around. It's very sort of uh, interactive with the audience. And, you know, we couldn't do that in this case, but that's normally the way that we sort of almost kind of, uh, you know, activate a perf uh, an exhibition is by doing either an opening or closing performance to really do something live in the space and give it an extra sort of kick. And 
you know, it was it was unfortunate that we were not able to do this. But that gallery um, at at uh, West Texas is normally, you know, given over to student shows and, and you know, uh, thesis shows and, and things like that. And then occasionally visiting artist shows in between. Yeah, that's exactly right. We use the IC, we call it the Institute of Contemporary Art. And there's a series of shows that are curated throughout the year when they bring in, you know, artists from around the world, either group shows or solo shows. But then it's used as a teaching gallery, teaching museum. It's, a, you know, it's an incredibly excellent space with all sorts of all the right technology. And um, so it's, it's terrific to be able to use it for the student work or as a basically as a threshold between the, the greater art world and the school. So it's, it's this nice sort of you know, threshold between the local school and what's happening in the, the art world or, you know, uh, and artists from around the globe. So, uh -huh. yeah. Hey, can we uh, see some of your dry points? Do you have any images of your dry points handy? Um, I might, I think I do. Let me see if I can get to them. I'm gonna go back to share screen. Be, you have a whole bunch of printmaking majors on here. Really? Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. printmaking it was one of my main focuses in school. I worked with a really dynamic teacher uh, named Linda Sokolowski and, um, I'm I'm really in, involved in uh, maybe this isn't the best. I saw some there at the bottom yeah yeah but I think I've got a better file uh, I had some stuff organized for last night let me see maybe here oh well maybe not so oh I know I know where I can go for this stuff this you know I'm I'm still getting my my tech together on, on all this kind of <laughs> it's stuff no problem. but we'll we'll look here on my website. here so here i'll oh, show yeah. you this little little movie first this is this is actually for, for printmakers will <laughs> will appreciate thank this. you for showing this this is that. awesome this is, and then you have i work with a master printer there so uh she does a lot of the actual hard work because i i don't do it often enough to really know what i'm doing but you know, i'm working right. on these records these are oversized like, records they're 16 you know, inch records yeah. from the 50s Okay, so you can see the places where I didn't wipe it well. When, you know, I was working on some little little kids' records. Okay, that's very different than yeah. Before. So here's some here's some images. These are little tiny six-inch records right here, and then these are sixteen-inch records. These these are great because I can see the Jasper Johns Target and your work and all these other things happening at once. Well, you know, especially with the um with with the the grooves of the of the of the the records there's there's definitely a target aspect happening you know i started these in paris uh, leah and i did a residency in paris for two summers for the summer of 2007 and, and then again the next year 2008 and uh they had the largest uh printing etching press in europe there they had this massive uh press and I hadn't done printmaking in a number of years. And, and the first year that we were there, they, they asked us to, they, they, they suggested that we start by working on little pieces of plexiglass, you know, before we started on copper or zinc or whatever. And so we were making, the, I made my first early prints there on pieces of plexiglass. And it struck me that if I was scratching into plastic, I could easily transfer the idea to scratching into, into records. And I started this series there called Black Noise that I've been kind of working on. Uh, I, we did a residency at uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design a couple of years later. And so I was I, I did more of them there. Um, but, you know, they, I started by calling them Black Noise. So that's where that's where the title came from. And I've been just kind of playing around with it ever since then. So here's some examples uh, of this stuff, you know, just on all different sizes. And they, they look pretty cool because they're they're very physical and they've got this uh element of the records the other thing i've been doing for you printmakers out there and which is like i made one print this is in uh this art school in the south of france uh, uh in in nice called a villa arson and the whole school all the buildings have this kind of rough rocks and so i made one print where i just took the record out and rather than scratched it i just kept rubbing it on these the sides of these buildings until it acquired this you know here's some you know for 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 printmakers, maybe for others, maybe this is less interesting, but. Um, these, no, these are great. This is awesome stuff, I love it. So made a, I'm not sure if I got that. This one was the one with the rubbed stone. So it's very subtle kind of skinny kind of thing. And and for you printmakers, what I've been doing a lot these days is uh, the image on the left is the print after it was inked. 
And then before uh, doing anything else to the plate, we were doing a second, what we called ghost print without adding ink. So a lot of these uh, prints exist in a seri in, in, in a pair. I'm not sure if all these are, but some like these are. This, the one on the right is the same plate reprinted without adding any further ink. So you get this kind of, uh, this kind of s more silvery kind of impression uh, from it. So uh, there's sort of a, a double, you know, they can, and the plate is still on the bed and bed in the exact same position. So since these are circular, you know, they, they, they don't always, uh, there's not every, every print is not exactly uh, in the same alignment, but uh, these two are paired together. So there's a lot of these paired uh, images where the, the first plate is the dark black one. And the second one is the, is kind of the, the ghost image. Do you, do you find that the vinyl was actually hold is holding any ink or how does that work? Yeah, it holds a lot of ink. You know, I work with with some vinyls that that have grooves in them already. So there's already like a, a, a texture that's holding ink and, and and they hold ink very well. But I also do work on on like a record record mastering, like things that professionals use that are mastering plates. So like the one on the left here has no grooves at all on it. When I started, it was it was mirror. Uh, like shiny, like shiny, like a mirror, and uh, and it's it's a whole different thing because then then it's only what the marks that you make are adding something. So I I, I actually like having the grooves there uh, to uh, to to give me a starting point. I was, you know, just because you mentioned uh, John Cage, I'll show you one other thing here while I'm uh, uh, while I'm looking at uh, at stuff here. Uh, I worked with a guy. Um, a Dutch artist named Zager Reyers, who um, who grows mushrooms on things. That's that's what he does. And actually, I can show you. Th this is kind of what he does. He grows mushrooms on things. This is his art. And he he seeds different things with spores. He he buries chairs at the bottom of the ocean for months, and and you know lets barnacles grow on them. This is kind of where his art is at. And uh, so he. Uh, we, we did a, collab a couple collaborative pieces, uh, one of which was uh, I was using the, the infinity symbol has been uh, I've been it's been something I've been long associated with. And so for this show in Europe uh, some years ago, we created these I created these graphic uh, music staffs that looked like uh, that had the infinity line on them, you know, five line music staffs. Uh, and he it, look, it looks like a cage alternative notation yeah well that's the idea these were became graphic scores and and we invited artists into the gallery space over the course of the show and they were to play their interpretation you know i was involved in a lot in graphic scores at that time and creating some and, and sonic youth did a whole record called goodbye 20th century where we were playing contemporary graphic scores yeah. and so we used this as a graphic score and, and at each you know whenever people came in if it was over the course of weeks the mushrooms would be in a different arrangement a different position and we said well use what you see and and you know give us a concert you know interpreting interpreting what you see here so these boxes became the graphic scores and then later I did some pieces where we set up a table and we asked uh, visitors to leave objects on the table, you know, out of their pockets or whatever. Excellent. And, and then uh, musicians would come in and kind of interpret uh, the, the, the scores. Um, and I, I, as another variant for, for an art, we did, we did a, here's Zager uh, constructing some of these boxes. Uh, around my scores and you know he would he, he seeds them with the spores of mushrooms and then they slowly grow. Um, so these you know when the boxes were shipped to the museum they kind of looked like this pretty empty and they were seeded and then over the course of many weeks the mushrooms sort of sprouted up and, and grew. Um, I don't know I think I got too big. Oh, and it's obviously so such a strong connection to cage working with the mushrooms right yeah. And uh, you probably know, Mitch, my early record called From Here to Infinity, that's all, uh, every track ends in a locked groove where that'll right. play forever until you pick up the needle. So Zager and I did a piece for a show in Germany uh, dedicated to the artist Paul Tech, where um, I created one of these records and you can kind of see it there. It's got some some locked groove. It's Every track ends in a locked groove, but it's also got right. a bunch of etchings in between the grooves. Um, and this record is called All the Stars in the Sky. And we, we, we put it on a turntable in the show and Zager seeded the, uh, 
the turntable with mushroom spores. Oh my God. The, the, the needle was playing this, you know, one track in a, in a locked groove. So it was just playing endlessly. And over the course of the show, the mushroom sprouted up around it from underneath the turntable and began slowing down the turntable. And eventually at a certain point, they actually stopped the turntable completely. Uh, and that's the way the, the piece stayed for, for the rest of the show was in this kind of stopped, uh, stopped form. There doesn't have to be a recording of that. <laughs> you know, it, it happened over over many weeks, so it would it would have been a very long recording. But uh, uh, it it was a cool sort of you know just the fact that the pieces these pieces with the mushrooms evolved was was really nice. Um, I that's I'm really glad glad you shared that stuff. It's it's incredible, um, and and that, that we got a, a chance to sort of look more at your work and the printmaking. I was just curious, um, were you involved with the, because uh, I did the films for a John Cage performance of the Concherka Bow, and I can't remember if Sonic Youth or you were involved with part of that multimedia per performance of the songbooks. You know? um, I don't think so. This is, that's in Amsterdam you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, because I know there was a whole bunch of musicians were involved from, you know, a lot of noise musicians were involved with that from New York or Japan, and but they had commissioned me to make the films for the walls. So I use his score. Okay. I used a score based, and then I, I used a score, and it was about Concord, New Hampshire, uh, Concord, Massachusetts, uh, that, that piece. So I went there and reshot all the pieces that he talks about, John Cage talks about. I shot, reshot them today. So it used to be a field, and now it's a Dunkin' Donuts, or it used to be this river, and now it's a subdivision. Yeah. And it was, it was a very sort of Dam Graham type video installation, but it was nice to have the whole Concherka bow to project on. Okay, now that's interesting because last night I, I did a, a, a I, I wrote a piece for a, a string orchestra in Europe, like about a 20, 22 member orchestra, and that's where it premiered was in the Concertgebouw in, in Amsterdam, and so I was showing images of that building uh, last night. Oh, but that's I, incredible! I involved in that uh, cage. Uh, was that a Holland Festival or something? It, like it that? was. It was a Holland. Okay, yeah. So you know, we I did my piece was also at Holland Festival. I don't know if that was the same year. And, and Sonic Youth played the Holland Festival a couple times as well. I, I can't remember the. Holland I can't remember Festival. the year. I can't. I'm, I'm blanking on the year. So, yeah. but it was really fun to be involved. I think it was around. It was around 2001. It was probably 2000. Okay, so I don't think this was the same same yeah. time as the work that I did in that building. But that's um, a magnificent building for concerts. That's for oh, sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Um, maybe we'll, I know you have to run. Maybe another question from a student, and then we'll we'll sure. we'll, we'll, we'll take we'll, we'll let you get to the studio. Mitchell, there's one in the chat. I think the student had to go, but maybe oh. they can watch the recording. Uh, Alyssa Goodrick. Oh, uh, I never referred to the chat. Can you see that? Uh, If whoever was talking, do you want to read it? If you if you can sure see it? sure it's chat, but I don't know which one you're talking about. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. thank you. thanks, Adrian. It's from Aressa Goodrich. It says so. I really have to go to make okay, this yeah. class, but I wanted to know about your songwriting style and what inspired you to be so personal and intimate when writing from what seems like your own perspective and even the characters you've written about. What drove you to pull that version of storytelling into the music scene? Well, that's a, that's interesting. I mean, to 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 my mind, a lot of uh, that storytelling, sing, songwriting, and lyric writing is a forum for that kind of intimacy. And a lot of the music I like has that kind of personal, uh, intimate quality to it, as as almost a matter of course. And uh, and uh, I guess I was simply trying my hand at it, but. You know, I, I love that idea of your, your especially if you're listening, you know, it, it's maybe a little bit less apparent when you're listening to bands, but when you're listening to solo artists or, uh, you know, if, if you're listening to you know, everyone from whether it's Cat Power or somebody younger or Leonard Cohen or Joni Mitchell, you're getting kind of a window into their life and and their thoughts and their, you know, what they're thinking about, what they're what the way that they live and. And to me, that was always really interesting because it was a, someone sharing their own experiences and you find correlations and, and uh, relationships with what they're going through uh, to, to your own life in a sense. And, and so it was kind of, it was about uh, making the leap from thinking, uh, you know, well, if this is something that's on my mind or personally affecting me, maybe uh, 
you know, it, it's likely that there's other people out there that are feeling similar things. And so, you know, trying my hand at, at that idea, you know, and it's, it's always been, even since the earliest days of Sonic Youth, I've always been one to write fairly personally about that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of affected my lyrics as a matter of course, in a sense. And are, are, I'm just curious, as a follow-up, are, are some of those poems that you're then developing into lyrics, or I'm just curious how, if you, if you, you know, how you work between poetry and lyrics, or do they overlap? Or? Sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I straddle these different uh, disciplines because I make visual art and I make music and I write, I write poems and, and texts. And so, uh, and I, I've kind of always pursued all three of those. And so they, they, there's a lot of places for cross fertilization. Sometimes that piece you were talked about at the beginning at the forks, that was that existed just simply as words on paper as a poem for a number a couple of years before it transformed into a song lyric or lots of times uh, at one point I was doing a lot of poetry. Uh, where I was making poems from spam that I was receiving on the Internet like these email you know poems uh, you get all these weird mails for you know a pe penis enhancement or you know whatever the hell they were, but the way that they slipped through your your spam filters was they'd fill the, the the emails with just random words as that looked like it looked like text and it was text but it was not intelligible text it was almost like a, a dictionary exploded and there were all these words and i was finding this in the bottom of hundreds of emails in one particular period of time and it was really a a, a spam filter fooling thing that these these phishing sites were using but I started collecting all those words and it was just like random words put together and it didn't make any sense. But every once in a while, you'd find two or three words together that felt like a little poem or something like that or a haiku or something. And I, I started collecting reams of this stuff and then pulling words out and constructing poems from them. I call them my internet spam poems. And, you know, I was taking things directly from these weird amalgams and then changing some things or adding some words of my own. I constructed a whole series of poems like that. And at the time I was making these big uh, paintings on canvas. And so I started putting some of these phrases and words onto the canvases, you know, so words became lyrics, lyrics became poems, words went on to some of the canvases, you know, ideas from working visually transferred to, to music writing or, or backwards, you know, in another direction. So I, I really feel like they feed each other. You know, I write about music uh, sometimes or I write about art and then, you know, maybe apply some of those things to things I'm actually making in the studio. And, it, it, you know, sometimes it makes for, you know, an ambiguous viewpoint on my work because it's, it's, it, it, it occupies all these different areas from, from music, which is probably the thing I'm most well known to well known for to you know visual art and and to writings and small books and poetry books and journals and, and things like that but um but i like the breadth of it and the fact that these these different disciplines can kind of bounce off each other yeah it sounds like it sounds like what you're describing there is a bit sort of the, a cage or like a william burroughs type process too potentially well, the cut-ups were very, the, the uh, Burroughs cut-ups were really an antecedent to what I was doing with these spam poems. I mean, because, uh, you know, he was, he was looking for the, the messages in between the line. He would take like a newspaper article and cut all the, the lines up and reorder them and think that he was able to find some kind of meaning that was there, but not stated as such in the original article. And uh, he was really into this idea. And um in a way, putting these words together, you know, I formed some really wacky surrealist poems and, and they made their own kind of sense in a certain way that wasn't, uh, you know, some of them were translated for some translated books and the translators had a hell of a time because they didn't make any sense in English and how were they going to translate it, you know, whether they translated each word literally or, you know, it was it was a really funny process to go, to try and uh, help these translators through how to how to uh, how to uh, translate something that was surrealist to begin with, you know, and how to both keep it nonsensical and make sense of the translation at the same time. Well, uh, I, I, we could go on forever, but I, I know you probably need to get a snack before printing. <laughs> I do. I need, I need to get it yeah, to to go. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, well, we want to thank you so much for coming. And uh, we'll give you a 
a wave goodbye. So thanks. Thank you. When Thank you're in Maine, come to Mecca and make prints with us. Okay, yes. I would love to do that. You guys should have some kind of a print residency and, and, and invite me up there. I mean, okay, that's, that's we can, we, we can make it happen. happen. We can that's make it happen. Way I make prints these days is, you know, I'll get invited to do a residency like that one in Nice or at NASCAD where we were for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I'm always looking yeah. for a, a place, a print shop with a, with a, with a press to go and, and work on because that's not the kind of stuff you can normally have in your home studio, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We have stone litho. We've got a big etching press. We've got letter press, all kinds of stuff. We'll be in touch. Okay. That would be great. I, I would love to, you know, and I love coming to Maine. I, my, these days, my lyric writer uh, partner is uh, the author, Jonathan Lethem. Oh, he's up in Blue Hill. Yeah. Yes. Oh, he's, wow. been, he's up in Blue Hill in the summers and we've been uh, collaborating on song lyrics for the last few years and the last couple records, that record uh, Names of North End Women that we were talking about and the one before that. And uh, it's been a really interesting exchange with him. He's he's kind of an old friend at this point and we recently you know hooked up to, to write lyrics together and are continuing that. And I know he's spending his summers up there in Maine and mm -hmm. I've always kind of got an invitation to go up there and visit him as well. So, so let's make it happen. You're let's welcome. Let's do it. We can definitely do it. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. This all is amazing. You finishing your school year. I hope you guys all have good summers and keep pursuing uh, whatever it is you're doing. And to those of you who are graduating, that's that's pretty impressive. Uh, good luck with whatever you do next. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Lee. I'll, I'll be in touch. Take care. Okay. Okay. Have I'm a good time. And leave you guys to it. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, class, for uh, those who stayed. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, you can, uh, the same to you. Everyone do well, be healthy, have a good summers. And I look forward to reading your papers. I'm glad you got to hear Lee speak. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. I'll see you.